Uh, we have got to get all of this straightened out. Uh, the dreamers are entirely different, but they too are immigrants. And if we had uh, an immigrant policy, we would have places, at least pockets, where we knew where to place people. Yes, uh, we are getting people coming to this country, particularly from, from Central America, uh, that in, in large numbers, we do not have the kind of policy that would make them want to stay in their home country. You might ask, uh, you might ask well, why isn't the United States offering aid at, to the, the Central American countries, uh, not to mention all kinds of expertise that would enable people to want to remain in their country. I don't stand here as someone who welcomes these immigrants saying we should be taking in all of the immigrants from Central America. I begin by saying what is keeping them from leaving Central America? This is very different from the immigration we've had from Mexico, for example. These are people who are leaving in, in threat of their lives, at coming to the richest uh, country in the world, and frankly, the country that has all of the expertise and funding necessary to, make, uh, to help turn around those countries which are so close to our own. It is not as if we didn't have a, a virtual obligation there, even if people were not leaving. It says something about the importance that we attach to immigration policy uh, that um, the bill number for the DREAM Act is H.R. 6. That's a uh, prime number uh, to be listed among the first 10 bills. Now, there's a number, of course, that has been saved out for the District of Columbia. Uh, it's a number we asked for. It's H.R. 51 to make the District of Columbia the 51st state of the <laughs> Union. <laughs> so numbers do matter. Uh, uh, we um, are looking closely, uh, particularly in this city, at the 800,000 uh, dream dreamers uh, who have come to our city and live right here. Uh, I had a forum where I invited some representative dreamers to come in. Uh, I, it's very hard to find young people who were more impressive than these young people. Some of them going to college, they all have good jobs. <laughs> They're what we want our children to be <laughs> when they grow up. And these are people who were brought to our country by their parents, and we have left them without a country. And yet we, uh, we continue to fight this, excuse me, damn wall, because the wall still is on our plate. Um, uh, the president is trying um, uh, to get, uh, as I speak, their defections uh, from among uh, the Republicans on the wall, and he could lose it. We may not have enough to overturn his veto but uh, there are at least 15 defections uh, who I think are beginning uh, to, to look at where the country is and to know we have to find solutions for our immigration policy. Um, I am particularly uh, worried because of the temporary uh, deferred um, status that many uh, who live in the District of Columbia ha has. Uh, the president has tried to terminate temporary protective status. People who have fled their country do not have permanent uh, residence here, but are legally here. He has tried to terminate uh, this, this temporary status for individuals from Sudan, Nicaragua, uh, Haiti, and El Salvador. Uh, and that is what he's tried to do only recently uh, we were able to get a federal court ruling that has blocked him from doing so. Uh, so we, <laughs> we can't keep treating these immigrants who come here 
uh, in a way that our country should understand best. Because uh, at least for African Americans, for, for most Americans, if you will look back not too far in, in your own genealogy, you will find people who are coming to this country for the very same reasons. So I, I compliment you on this forum. I only wish I could stay because I'm sure I could get some better ideas here than I've been able to find in the Congress. Thank you very much. <laughs>
I'm happy to start. Um, so uh, the Dream Act is legislation that has been around for a number of years. I think the first time it was introduced was in 2001, but you know, had been in development leading up to that time. Um, it was, it's legislation that has been introduced many times on a bipartisan basis and has had support from a whole chorus of uh, sectors, uh, from the education community, the faith community, uh, the business community, all supportive of the idea that people who came to the United States at a young age should be able to continue to pursue their uh, opportunities here and prosper and flourish as they demonstrate that they have uh, through their time in the United States. Um, it's a bill that's garnered a lot of support uh, as it's continued to be introduced with the idea that we need a permanent solution. Uh, so the legislation looks at um, qualifications that people who came to the United States at a young age would have to meet in order to then qualify for a green card or a permanent resident status that would allow them to then eventually uh, apply for citizenship. Um, so as the Congresswoman mentioned, it is very exciting that it has been uh, reintroduced again today with tremendous support. Um, and again, part of the reason why it's always had so much support, and Lori, I think, can uh, attest to this, is that the people who have shared their stories who would either be uh, beneficiaries of the legislation passing or people who are family members, community members, who uh, know them well, um, have been able to see those stories and have been able to understand why. This is such an important piece of legislation that um, builds on an investment that's already been in, made in the country. So um, it's really been great to see the support grow over time. Yeah, maybe I'll just add a little bit, because um, I think it's important to sort of understand a little bit about the past to kind of wrap our hands around where we are now. And you know, some of you may already know this, but the last immigration reform ever that took place in this country was in 1986. Many of you weren't born. That was called IRCA. It stood for Immigration Reform and Control. The reform meant that some very lucky people could get immigrants, could get on a pathway to citizenship. The control meant you're out. You don't meet the criteria, you're not getting in. So as a result, there's been these different sort of attempts over the last 40, 86 to wherever we are now, mm -hmm. to try to figure out how to help and support the immigrant community all across the country, and particularly, of course, what means so much to us right now is in our region. The uh, temporary protected status, which people often don't they get confused about TPS, and an immigration lawyer, this could be a whole other panel, but temporary protective status did give some people in this country, many of the parents of the kids that I work with, probably many of your colleagues in the workplace, gave them some temporary relief. They were legal in this country, they could work, their conditions were not good in their home country, they did not have to go home, they could stay. Of course, we all know that Trump wiped that out for almost Haiti, El Salvador, Honduras, gone. So that was the first blow. The first blow was that our parents were gonna lose their ability to legally work in this country and we're gonna have to go underground again. The second blow, of course, was when the DREAM Act went down. Um, because the DREAM Act gave some hopefulness to a body of young people in this country that's, uh, that the deferred action, meaning it would be deferred to some other time, and that's that body of kids that today they pass the legislation. I was a little confused, quite honestly, with what the Congresswoman said, because I'm not sure if this legislation also included some temporary protection status removal. The number is a million in the legislation. There's 800,000 Dreamer kids, maybe the other 200,000. So anyway, even for people who live, sleep, drink this stuff, sometimes you have to really dig to understand. Um, but, is, but, but it is the Dreamer community that, 
WPAS has focused on beautifully through the arts tonight in recognition of all that they have brought to our country every single day. Thank you, and thank you for jumping into the TPS topic as well. Oh, okay. No, no, no that, that's oh. great. Yeah. Well, it's kind of hard to understand the yeah. dreamer thing without no, the definitely. TPS, because it's all combined, the parents and the kids and the families. Mm -hmm. you know. so, so I just wanted to add to the, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation, greatly appreciate it. Uh, one of the things that comes up too, and we support it very much as the Dreamers, is because as mentioned in the beginning, we're all about supporting students, um, specifically college students, to come and learn about the intersection here in DC of uh, politics, policy, and people, right? It's, it's, it's that mix of all those three. Uh, and part of it too comes up with, in particular with Dreamers, it also is um, related to our education system uh, and some of the universities that have been very much supportive of, of Dreamers and of students in particular. And so we're always looking for the universities that we can collaborate with, that we can work with. Just a quick story to share is we have a partnership with Florida International um, University. And uh, we have an internship program where students can intern in Washington, DC. Half of the semester is with a, a member of Congress. The second half of the semester is with a corporate government affairs office, right? So they can see both sides of the discussions. Well, we have this partnership with FIU, and we tell them, you know, give us your best student of this honors program, and give us an alternate in case he or she can't attend. Well, we have a student in our program right now who is seeking asylum from Venezuela. Not exactly the same, but you know, in terms of FIU's partnerships and, and their support, um, the system is all backed up. Uh, there's even more at pending cases, so he's still waiting to figure out what's going to happen to him. In the meantime, he's doing a great job on the Hill, and the member of Congress wants to offer him a full-time job, but he can't. He can't accept that offer. So we're, we're not even really sure what are the other opportunities, right? So that's always a struggle, too, is working with college students, being hopeful, helping them sign up for every program they possibly can, looking for the universities to help. And then we kind of run into another you know, situation where we can't. So um, I bring that up so that we can also open the conversation uh, to the universities and make sure that we do our best to applaud and recognize the universities at every level who are helping um, the students because that's a really important part of the mix. Uh, and they're the ones that have, you know, almost all the best talent uh, of the dreamers and other students in that same, in that, in that similar situation that they're stuck in. Thank you. I'd like to ask Councilmember Grasso if, uh, if he could speak to the role of local government and thinking of DC as a really interesting example as a state, state government and also the city government. Um, and the council, of course, is the legislat uh, legislature for the, the state entity. Um, what? What is the city government facing as these policy changes are happening by the hour? And how, how can you even handle that in the education system in terms of uh, social services? Um, well, thank you also for having me tonight. Um, and you know, it's interesting in the District of Columbia because we are what you said. We are a city, state, and county. Um, and unfortunately, we also have our overlords, the federal government, constantly hounding us. So. Um, one example where I think we're impacted and, you know, we have, I think, a, a city government that is very committed to making sure that everyone is welcome here uh, and that everyone has an opportunity to succeed here in the District of Columbia. But one of the very clear problems we have is with the federal government interfering on a regular basis with the things that we're allowed to do. So we have what's called the Healthcare Alliance in the District of Columbia, which has been a wonderful opportunity to expand uh, insurance coverage to uh, as many people as we can. And so the District of Columbia has almost 100% coverage for insurance. Um, and we constantly worry that the federal government's going to step in because the alliance now is m populated mostly by undocumented workers and people in the district. Um, and that means that they are on an official list. It means that they are exposed. It means that they might end up being in a position where they have to explain themselves. And that makes us all very nervous. And um, we are constantly looking for opportunities to protect our residents from this type of um, interference. Um, one place we can't do it is in our criminal justice system. So 
Um, uh, you all may know that we don't have our own uh, criminal justice system in the District of Columbia. The federal government, um, the U.S. Attorney, prosecutes most of our uh, cases for adults. And when you go to uh, serve time in the District of Columbia, you go to the Bureau of Prisons, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, many, many, many people who have violated laws are handled by the Marshal Service, which is also a federal entity. So as much as we would like to say, MPD, you're not allowed to coordinate with ICE, you're not allowed to coordinate uh, across the city um, with their raids and things like that. We can do that and MPD listens to us. We can't stop it once they've gone beyond that. And we have a very hard time even collecting the data on that. Um, but there are other ways that we've been able to, as a city, try to protect the rights of all of our residents. And one way, for example, I'm the chair of the Committee on Education, um, and I had noticed since I've been in office that there is, uh, there are a lot more uh, unaccompanied, uh, undocumented students in our school system um, who should and can find sanctuary in the school building. When they come to school, um, when their parents come to school with them, they shouldn't be targeted there. And so we uh, sent a letter to uh, the Depar to D DCPS, the DC Public Schools, as well as all of the charter schools and said, what is your commitment to making sure that ICE agents or other immigration officials are stopped at the doors of our school buildings? And um, they sent us back a notification that they supported that and that they would do that. That is part of, I think, part of what it means to be a sanctuary city and what we can do locally. Um, DC population is, in the past uh, few years, it's been documented that we're about 15%, more or less, of, of people who are immigrants. Um, and I think that it would be great if we were an immigration, uh, that if we were such a sanctuary city, that that could grow. Um, it only makes our city better. Um, the diversity, the, um, uh, the bringing, bringing people who are different together uh, in the District of Columbia, which happens to be the capital of the United States, I think sends a message to the rest of the world in a meaningful way that, that we welcome difference, that we welcome uh, people who can push us to be better people and can actually make our city better for it. Um, I actually think our country would be better too the more that we embrace difference and the more that we embrace people coming in from other countries to be a part of our, our, our society. Thank you. Um, could any of you speak to the other state jurisdictions that might not be as supportive of the immigrant population. And so for example, I think it was the Secure Communities program that existed a while back um, where states such as one of our neighbors were being very, very active in terms of encouraging cooperation between the local law enforcement agencies and the, the immigration officials at the federal level. Does anyone have uh, experience with any of that? Um, yeah, I can share some examples that we've seen um, where localities, states, municipalities really do have an opportunity to <coughs> say that they're going to be an inclusive um, community and state and municipality or that they don't want to be. Um, a lot of that has been sent in signals um, around really high profile um, cases that are working their way through um, the judicial system. So for example, um, back in 2014, the previous administration had just sought to build upon the success of DACA where um, you know, people were able to come forward and demonstrate that they met the qualifications to get a work permit that would allow them to stay in the country and not worry about deportation. So, uh, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people had to come forward and applied for that, and the administration thought um, that should be expanded, and in fact, uh, had a proposal to expand it to parents of U.S. citizens, thinking these are parents of, you know, our future, and it's in the best interest that these kids are going to be able to focus in school, to be able to uh, do well, because they don't have to worry about their parents. Uh, so wouldn't parents be able to come forward and show that they would qualify for deferred action as well. That was stopped by litigation that was started by the state of Texas. Uh, so a number of Republican governors and attorneys general uh, signed on to, um, lit to litigation to stop that from being implemented. And now we're kind of seeing the reverse of that under this administration where um, governors, attorney general, attorneys general, city councils, are sending a message that they're opposing a lot of the executive orders under this administration. So that's one place where I think we've seen a lot of activity um, that states and localities are taking to demonstrate 
um, support of executive actions or, or opposition to them. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I don't know the nation. We were in Prince George's and Montgomery County's the district. I think the thing the council member points out where it's particularly challenging is the relationship with ICE. You know, you can have the best intention, and we've, you know, our mayor came out and said, we don't share information with ICE, but something happens and sure enough, ICE was there. You know, so you don't know how they got there, who called them, but they're there. So even though I believe the intentionality to say we're gonna try to, you know, keep ICE out of the picture, sometimes I think the inevitability of it, it makes it very challenging for the jurisdictions. You know, early in the administration, that, there was that whole thing about if you call yourself a sanctuary city, we're gonna swipe your money. And, you know, there was just so much fear out the gate. And I noticed, like, it wasn't like a heartbeat after uh, TPS, well, after the election, that we were getting calls from Prince George's County Public Schools saying, what do you need us to do? How can we help? If parents want to opt out of the directory, they can. They don't have to put their names. They don't have to put their addresses. They can still participate in after school programming. You tell us, what should we do? We want our children to come to school. We want them to feel safe. Um, you know, Montgomery County, just uh, state of Maryland just passed this thing where kids can go to community college for free. So now we're talking to them the dreamers, is that for dreamers? Is that for undocumented kids? What do we know? And we're not getting straight answers yet because there is a difference between being a dreamer and an undocumented. There's all these labels that immigrants have been given, but the, the labels they carry do um, sit on their shoulders in a way that sort of dictates what they can and cannot do, what they can and cannot be eligible for. I mean, uh, you know, when the dreamer thing and the TPS, we had parents asking us to become the guardians of their children because parents were faced with, my kids were born here, I'm losing, that's not a dreamer, that's a US citizen, but I'm losing my temporary protective status. Should I stay, should I go, should I keep the kids, should I take the kids? I mean, the trauma, whether it's a dreamer family or a TPS family or just a purely undocumented family, the trauma that people are living with now around their children's desire for success. And kids, kids persevere anyway, but that, that wasn't your question. I'm sorry I got off. But I think in terms of Virginia, and I, Virginia t does not have a history of being particularly uh, friendly, although I think if you drill it down to local jurisdictions, to school boards, to particular administrators, to a school counselor, that's where you find the heart and soul, and they do what they can, I think, across the nation today. I just wanted to add that kind of goes back to all politics is local, right? So you, I, I grew up in Central California, and I'm working in DC, and I also recently um, moved to Miami, and it's completely different. You know, when I talk to my parents back home in California, life is, life is very different. When, when I was growing up, well, maybe not growing up, but maybe a little bit older, but it's still gonna date me uh, for some who are familiar with it. So there was a time in California when there were a lot of English only uh, laws trying to be passed by um, a couple of different governors at the time. And my parents were farm workers. My dad came to the US as a bracero uh, and you know went through all that process. And um, we were all five of us, I'm the eldest of five, we were all born in a farm worker camp. And so you listen to English only and you're not really making sense of that. Now I'm in my Miami, I'm like, well, you gotta speak Spanish if you're gonna be in Florida. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's all very different. Um, and it also depends on what the local uh, council, commissioner, supervisors, or, or governor, for example, just recently in Florida, we had the situation with the hurricanes in Puerto Rico. That, that you know, that they, they're, uh, they're considered American. You don't need a passport to go to Puerto Rico, in case some people still don't know that. Uh, and so you have a group of students who need a place to go and need to finish school. So the, the governor opened the state and said, come on over here and finish, finish your study or take a semester, or whatever, and then go back. But it, it all comes down to at the local level. One of the things that's come out in the last few re remarks uh, is the difference in statuses and how that affects family units. 
Uh, so in, in some families, it's entirely possible that you could have the two parents with different statuses. Um, and then you could have two, three, four children, and many of them could have different statuses from each other and also from the parents. Um, what is the impact on the individuals and the families in that situation, and how can they, how do they handle that? What services are, are available for them? Well, that's what the youth center is is all about, and I think you know at the youth center we have kids who were born here to kids who got here yesterday, and everything in between. And there's nothing on the uh, uh, the entry thing that says what's your documentation status. You know, there's no question about that in our system. However, you eventually figure that out because you know you try to enroll them in this and they can't get in that. I think, you know. For all, unless you were born here and live here, although even that's tough. I don't know if y'all saw the little article in the paper today. It slipped through with all the other news that the U.S. government is closing the 21 immigration uh, processing states uh, offices across the country. And that's how, across the world, all overseas. And that's how families would process a family member or an asylum case. So the whole thing has just gotten... So it, it does, there's not one family that's not impacted. But I think, you know, it's been p particular, it was hard before. I can't remember a time at the youth center, quite frankly, and I worked there 39 years, where there weren't challenging situations. Then you'd have these hopeful moments, and then you'd get your heart broken again. And then you'd have, a, and, and young people, we just kept saying to them, go to school, stay in school, you know, you can succeed, you know, we're trying to push doors open. Parents would come in, kids would come in, why should I go to school, I'm gonna get sent back, or my dad lost his job, I have to work. You know, there's just every scenario you can imagine, but I think it's important to note, and again, I think it's the stories of the dreamers' kids that have carried the day the will of the dreamer kids, the, the group of young people who said, we're tired of this, we're gonna walk to Washington, D.C., and we're gonna make our voices heard. So there's an extraordinary resilience, I think. I'll do, I will put in a little pitch for our book. Um, we have some here, and before the time is over, I have two quick passages I'll read, but this was written by 20 kids. They weren't all dreamers, but they were all youth center kids about their story. It's called Voices Without Borders. And there's some extraordinary excerpts, and if we have time, I'll read two very short paragraphs. But I think the case management services vary. Like, there's a colleague here in the audience who worked so closely with us when one of our kids uh, got picked up by ICE. It was a random thing, and it's a very complicated story. His church got involved, the youth center got involved, volunteers were getting involved. We were looking for connections back in, I think he's from Honduras, we were trying to figure that out. You know, you really feel people come together. Sadly, the young person gave up, wanted out of jail, and went back, but so many people were helping him. That's just one child, you know, and there's hundreds of them, you know, experiencing this kind of trauma. And the parents have lost their sense of hopefulness, especially those that have the TPS. It's really tough. I just want to add, if I can, that um, when you have uh, the need to be resilient, it often comes from a place of adversity and challenge. And I think we need to recognize that as a society and that the place to intervene is when somebody's young and when somebody is going through school. And it's important, I think, for us to put more mental health services, more uh, to make more of our schools trauma-informed so that um, we're not just saying, boy, aren't you resilient? Good for you for picking yourself up. Um, uh, we, you know, I, I heard uh, an amazing uh, testament um, of a journey when I was at a LAYC event last uh, year or two ago where a student had, a, a young person had walked, uh, literally walked from Guatemala to the District of Columbia to try to improve his life. Well. Um, we should be celebrating that commitment. We should be celebrating that resilience. But I think it's really important for our society um, and for all of us as individuals to recognize the trauma involved in that and the adversity that that person has experienced and then to work to help resolve it, to give that um, the freedom to the person to know that they don't have to carry that around for the rest of their lives. Um, and unfortunately, I think in our immigration policies in this country, 
um, we are constantly re-traumatizing people. So back to your point, uh, Nick, the, the reality is, is that when you have a family member that you know might be um, sent back to El Salvador after not being there for 35, 40 years, or your younger sibling who happened to have been born back in your home country is not going to be allowed to stay anymore. I mean, these are traumatic moments in a family's life that, um, you know, A, we should stop doing to them if we can, and B, when it happens, we should make sure we have professionals involved, mental health uh, care, clinicians to work with them on a regular basis. If I can add it, I mean, I think that the book that well, Laura was talking it, it about, is, it part um, of it. yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic book, and it does highlight the stories and the voices of individuals, and then I'll make a plug as well, uh, that this Friday, we have a report coming out that looks at some of the data and the numbers that are sort of a companion to the individual stories that looks at there's estimated to be 6 million U.S. citizen children who are, in fact, part of this debate about undocumented immigrants. Uh, they live with a parent who is undocumented, and it's to your point, council member, it is about, you know, U.S. citizen kids, their education, their opportunities to prosper and to flourish in this country that they are citizens of. Um, I think that's why there's organizations like the American Association of Pediatrics, the National, um, the, edu the teachers unions, um, and other organizations that deeply care about the development of children that are very engaged in this debate and want to see uh, solutions because of what it means prospectively for the next generations that we're um, going to see here as our citizens grow up. Thank you. Um, before we shift into going back into history to, to learn some more about the context, I'd like to ask Marianne uh, if you could speak to the importance of L Latinos and Latinas and Latinx individuals running for office, uh, what does it mean to have increased representation by Latinx individuals and also immigrants in Congress now? So as I mentioned earlier, we, we do our best to get some of the young uh, Latinos um, and Hispanics here to learn a little bit more about the process, how things work and sometimes how they don't work, <laughs> right? Um, What's important is that um, in the Latinx, um, this next generation even, it, there is such diversity among the group already. And however you slice diversity, whether that's gender, interracial, religion, countries of origin, um, you, mix it, you mix it all together. It's important because as we look to who we want to represent us as a diverse country, we need our diverse students to learn the process, to learn how it works, to learn how it doesn't work, so that they can be better informed and better educated and really stand for the rest of us, right? Uh, and to make sure that they have those opportunities as well. This is, as you all know, this is not the same Congress as it was a couple years ago. Uh, there's a lot more women, yay to the women. Uh, and um, we also have a lot more new news in terms of diversity, in terms of religions represented. Now, the other part of it is getting through diversity and diverse issues is not easy. That's the hard part. But I think that this generation gets that, and they see that it's not easy. They have a lot of good teachers. Uh, they've learned from some of us kind of elder and some of our mistakes and things that maybe we haven't corrected. Um, and so I just think that there's going to be a lot of very, very well-informed, well-educated, uh, younger uh, elected officials coming up. Uh, whether they start, and many start in school boards, uh, whether they start at the school board or they jump right to Congress, just like we've seen in, in this last Congress. Um, but I think it's important that if you are in that age range, that you consider running for office. You don't have to be a political science major. It could be any major. As you probably know, the majority of the people on the House and the Senate side didn't study political science. They have a mix. Uh, and there's experts on all kinds of topics. So I'm really looking forward to the next round and keep going. Um, not only does our organization do this, but uh, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute has training programs. 
The um, Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities has the programs. The Congressional Black Caucus Foundation has programs. There's a lot of other opportunities. Uh, so if anybody has uh, a young adult who's interested in an internship program in Washington, uh, you can call our office, check our website. Uh, we'd love to help navigate that, that young adult to where they should be landing if it's not in our program. Thank you. Uh, shifting gears a bit, uh, what have been the major inflection points in the evolution of immigration policy since 1986 when we had that reform? And uh, what have been some of the tension points within the movement for reform between, uh, say, comprehensive reform and pushing for that legislatively or pushing for the DREAM Act as an individual thing? I can start. Uh, yeah, so um, in 1986, the Immigration Reform and Control Act was passed, and it did allow a number of people to be able to regularize their status. Um, and there have been conversations since then um, under you know, Republican and Democratic administrations when Congress has been led by different parties. Importantly, it has always been um, bipartisan efforts. So in the mid-2000s, there were bills in the Senate that were introduced by Senators Kennedy and McCain. Um, there's been um, you know, sustained efforts uh, by the thing that I think has been important through the debates is that there's so many sectors that are impacted by our policies that has brought a lot of people to the table. And that continues to this day. I mean, you have uh, really strong business interests from sort of big Fortune 500 companies to smaller organ you know, uh, companies that all have an interest in um, the employment side of our immigration system, we see that in the District of Columbia with a lot of um, entrepreneurs and businesses that see that need. But there's also an intense need from the agricultural side. And so there's constantly members uh, hearing from ag industries, from you know, cattle uh, to you know, crops. So there's intense interests uh, from a lot of different sides, the faith community across many different um, congregations regularly talk to members of Congress about the need to have more humane laws. Um, and then there's other interests that we've talked about, like the education community and civil rights communities that talk to members of Congress about, we need practical solutions. So this is a little bit to the point of um, needing to have these issues addressed at one time. So we both need to address who's in the country now and how people that, for example, the people with TPS on average have been here for 22 years. Uh, so how to allow people to come forward, show eligibility, go through background checks, and then be able to be um, you know, on a path to citizenship here. Then we need to look prospectively. How do we want our immigration system to work? And that's a really critical part where um, there's family interests. How should people be able to reunite with loved ones here? Uh, there's humanitarian interests. And then you have um, conversations around enforcement and how do we enforce the laws uh, so that we know who enters, how they enter, um, all of those pieces. So the, the debates have always been around those key components with the idea that you need to take care of it all at once. Um, however, we have seen efforts um, where members have decided, let's you know, s see if we could get a good faith effort to pass one bill, and perhaps that could lead to some momentum uh, that would show that something is able to get passed, so we could build from that. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't happened. So in 2010, there was an effort to pass the DREAM Act in the Senate that fell short by five votes. Um, and it had passed in the House. So had those five votes been uh, found, that would have passed. Um, and it hasn't really had um, a companion get through the chambers since. But I mean, the opportunities and the climate have been ripe for quite some time, and the interests are there. Um, so there's, that's why I think there continues to be hope. And I'll just say that as 
you know, these debates have been, um, we haven't been able to have legislation passed, support for it has grown. So we see poll after poll showing that the public does support a pragmatic solution. Um, so in, in fact, in these last couple of years where we've seen really tough enforcement measures, in fact, support for a solution has grown. The American public understands that it is good to have immigrants here. They are contributing, they're taxpayers, all of those things that uh, many of us know um, are you know, more firmly believed now than ever before, as has been shown by a number of polls. Yeah, I guess I obviously everyone's hopefulness is comprehensive reform. Honestly, it's not been within reach for years. Um, and whether it was one administration or another, they just seemed to run out of fuel, you know, to, to make that happen. And unfortunately, the current climate just, you know, exacerbated the, the negativity. But this too will end. You know, it, it's everything ends at some point. So having said that, the dreamer story was something people could really wrap their hands around. And the young people themselves were quite clear about their lack of willingness to be used as pawns in the, the whole government shutdown thing. So they, even though their lives and their ability to stay here depended on, on, on uh, getting something passed, they were very clear about not on the backs of, of so, so who knows, you know, what will happen today. Uh, you know, the House will probably pass it, and then I don't know if it'll pass in the Senate. If it did, you know, Trump would probably veto it. So, you know, you, you kind of just got to get up every day and go to work. And kids walk through your doors, and whether they're a U.S. citizen or just got here, our goal was the same, to, to get doors open for them, to keep them hopeful, to try to you know advocate in the city to help them, to be there for their families and the staff too, because a lot of your staff are in the same boat, you know, and they're not so different sometimes in who the young people are. So I have to say, I think I kind of lost some real hopefulness with the turn of events in the last election, but you know I hear that that people. Uh, want this, and I understand the complexity of the of the question. Personally, most days I don't feel too optimistic, but then I know this too will end and something will change. And most importantly, every single kid that walked through the youth center's doors, we were and their families, we wanted to be there for them. And there's some really, you know, if you think about the big picture and trying to change the law, sometimes it was hard to get up every day and go to work. You re I really needed to think about the young person in front of me, the family in front of me, the, you know, bugging David about our loss of funding, whatever it was, you know, on behalf of, of our young people so that we could, you know, I, I used to talk about, it's not about leveling, the, it's not just about getting them on the playing field and leveling it, it's making the game work for them, not the game of what we saw today in the news, but I'm just saying, you know, you gotta get those kids out there and knock down doors, and there's people all over this region who wanna help these kids. And we have amazing stories of, of accomplishment, yet the truth remains, they live with a big rock on their back about, can I stay, can I go, don't get in trouble, don't get a, don't, God forbid you get stopped by a police officer, you know, for a driving ticket, don't have a tail light out. I mean, these are the things we were telling the kids and their parents you know, just keep your head down. I mean, this is not a, a pleasant message. Yet the kids, well, they, they're kids. They want to go to school. They want to learn. They want to run for office. They want to have all the neat jobs that we've had. And that's our job to make sure we facilitate that for them. Um, I just want to add one component to this, and I really appreciate what you guys have said. Um, there is, in my mind, a, a compelling argument to be made that uh, we as a country have to be responsible for and held accountable for the actions that we've taken internationally in, in history. And I think you've recognized that with uh, TPS and some other actions that have happened where we've recognized uh, you know, that we've made mistakes. And uh, especially, I think, um, when we've supported wars and overthrowing governments and things like that and put 
turmoil in the lives of people's lives where they live and why they want to come here in the first place. Um, and that we can't just um, turn our back then on people's uh, lives that we've impacted so, so dramatically. I just wanted to piggyback a little bit on what you said there, um, Council Member, in that we also need to look at uh, making sure when we look at the, the people who are coming in, so there used to be, and, and I have a Mexican heritage, so full disclosure, uh, where people would say, oh, it's just, you know, it's all about this group of Mexicans. It's always the Mexicans coming in. And we also need to look at what, to your point, what have we done as a country to help or hurt, in some other cases, other countries? Um, you know, uh, we're one of the few organizations that, um, as mentioned earlier, as hard as it is in comprehensive immigration reform, we supported that in 2013. And I think sometimes just the whole idea of comprehensive kind of throws people off. Uh, sometimes it's just, sometimes you want to take a little bite at a, at a time instead of trying to get the whole elephant in at once. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But along those lines too, we need to kind of think about what is happening in Venezuela? What is happening in Guatemala? What is happening in Honduras? And please pay attention to that. The traditional American news doesn't follow that and doesn't give us the perspective of what's going on in their business system, in their government system, until people show up at our front door. And that's kind of sad and very late to be thinking about that. Uh, we need to be paying more attention because we all came at some point from other countries. And what if people didn't pay attention to that at the time? Um, so I, I encourage all of you to really think about and look at and follow the news, um, international news on what's going on in, in our Western Hemisphere because that does matter, that is important. Um, those are families who need our help who at one point used to get our help uh, from our government and slowly but surely in the last few years hasn't. Um, so that's one aspect. And the other is that it's like everything else in life. Once you've learned something, you can't unlearn it. So once you've learned what's going on and you've been exposed to information, do the best that you can with that information to share it with somebody else, to make sure people who might be in a situation who might need help know that you are there or your organization is there because you cannot learn it once you learn it. Thank you. Uh, last question before we get into the reading and then also a mention about the artwork that is sitting behind us uh, is what is the role of the judiciary in all of this going forward? Because like right now, the, the, the DACA processing is happening because of the courts, right. it, whereas yeah. the administration would have stopped it. Um, is that where the hope lies for at least having temporary fixes in certain situations, or is that kind of the last ditch spot for hope? I'm any happy thoughts? for any ditch for yeah. hope. <laughs> you know, I, I thank God that judge put, put the hold on it, and hopefully what came out today, you know, or under a new administration will pass. The judiciary is key. That's, our, that's been our only sort of beacon of hope, of light, over the last few years. So. I'm, I'm all for it. I do think, it, um, you know, temporary fixes are um, helpful. We do need permanent solutions to change laws from Congress. But the other beacon of hope, I do think, lies in um, what is happening in cities and in counties and states and different parts of the country. And I do think D.C. has been doing great work. Um, one of the examples where D.C. is comparable with other jurisdictions uh, is in putting resources to critical immigration legal services. So one of the things that Laura is talking about with you know, needing to address the situation of the person in front of you, it's really important for people to understand that they need to see an immigration lawyer. I mean, we ha could have a whole other panel about the work that Ayuda does and fighting notarios and um, people being taken advantage of when there's so much changing policy, when there's so much misinformation. So having um, the support from cities in terms of you know, financial resources to nonprofit legal service providers is critical in this time. So I think that DC is doing it and there's places like California that are investing a significant part of their budget um, in
into immigration legal services is a really key thing to addressing the people that are coming to your door at the center every day. And, and I'll just note in, in another moment of hope. I don't, I mean, I think the courts are really important. I'm very worried about where we're going with the courts in this country with the number of judges that this administration has been able to get appointed. Uh, makes me nervous about the future, but for right now, I think they are great. The other place that I find hope is in everyday people. Um, you know, I have heard story after story of people stepping up and opening their homes or providing resources or doing something. Uh, I heard a story about how in San Antonio right now, um, there's a group of people that go to the airport every, I mean, I guess it's the airport every day and the train station every day to greet people that are dropped there by busload with a ticket to go somewhere in the country with an ankle monitoring device on their leg um, and have no, never been on a plane before, don't are new to the country perhaps, don't know where they're going. But these people go there and all they do is accompany them. All they do is say, hey, I'm a friendly person. I can help you to understand how to go through security, how to get to where you're going, let you know that you can't take your bottle of water in full. You have to empty it and fill it up on the other side. So I find hope in that, and I think it's really important that we, um, I think like you were saying, to lift up these voices of people that are willing to accompany um, new members of our community. Thank you. So I think we'll turn it over to Lori to yeah. read from the book. No, I'll, I'll be brief, but Nick, I just want to say thank you. You know, when, when you first came and talked to me about your idea to do something for the dreamers, I thought, what's he gonna do, you know? And as I have seen this come to light, through art and music and, and poetry and, and conversation. You just did such a beautiful job, so I want to say thank you. Thank you, Lori. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the other thing I'd like to say before I read this, just to piggyback off of current events, I mean, we also have to just be outraged about what's happening on the border right now. You know, those kids are the exact same kids who wrote this book and tell this story. They just happened to make it to the youth center, you know, and they're sitting in cages as we speak. And I, I think something about this in history is gonna go down is really bad, mm -hmm. you know, that we were not able to figure out how to stop this and reunite those children with those, their parents. So I just wanna kind of say that we've gotta keep, keep our eye on that. So this goes to exactly what you just, just said. These are two very short passages. We have the book here if any of y'all wanna see it or maybe buy it, but it was 20 kids who wrote it. They each tell their story, but it, this is what you just said. At the end of my story, I used the same symbol for the beginning. It's like a hole that many young people might find themselves in, like the lowest point in their lives. In the final part, the last page of my story, the same hole is there, but I'm outside of it. And I'm there holding a light, able to see everyone else's pain. I can find it because I have been there and I'm trying to help others find their way out. This was like written by an 18 year old, 17 year old. You know, and, and then here's a, just another very short one, short passage. These are extraordinary kids. And this book just won some national book thing. Um, uh, which we will post the details about on yeah, Twitter in I 10 minutes. Which I should know more about, but I don't work full time anymore. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, This was not the one I chose, but this one is equally as good. I hope the people reading this book learn about our stories, about the real reasons for why we come to this country. I hope they will not just judge us on how we appear, but will try to understand a little more of our truth. This project gave us the opportunity to express who we really are, and that matters. We want the public to know us better so that they can accept us as friends and neighbors. We don't want to be rejected. We want to feel like we belong. Thank so you. I think it's a great book. Thank you. So at this point, we'll get you ready for a Q&A, but I just want to uh, reference the painting that you see behind us here on stage. Uh, this is a work called Migrants. It's an oil on canvas that was completed in 2018. It's by a wonderful artist uh, who is a champion of the Latinx community here in Washington, D.C., and a, a beloved friend of 
pretty much everyone in town, <laughs> and most especially watching performing arts, and that is Hector Torres, who is right here in the audience. <laughs> and uh, this work has been on loan to us from uh, Children's National Hospital's uh, art collection, and also in your program on the cover is another work uh, by Hector that is part of this uh, initiative, and it's called In the Shadows, and it was just completed earlier this year. These two works have been kind of the the frontispiece of all of our programming around uh, the immigration topic this season. Uh, so we thank you, Hector, for, for championing this and, and helping us tell these stories. And thank you to Jay, of course, as well, for being uh, a huge champion uh, for the whole community here in Washington for so many years. Um, so Q&A. If you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. And uh, Polly here from NYU will bring you a microphone as uh, we want to make sure everyone on the live stream can hear. I, I just want to clear up something. I heard during the discussion, uh, Puerto Ricans considered uh, U.S. citizens. Uh, they're not considered. They are U.S. citizens, first of all. Hector and I are both Puerto Rican. Uh, and, and sometimes that's lost because of the historical perspective that people, uh, with all due respect to them, are ignorant of Puerto Rico, Guam, Virgin Islands. Um, so I just wanted to clear that up. But I wanted to ask, uh, two questions. Number one, where did the word dreamer come from? And how was it uh, used? And who put it into law or used it uh, to make it easier for everybody to understand? Um, and I just want to also comment that there's a very uh, wonderful Puerto Rican man by the name of Bob Garcia, who was involved with the 1986 legislation that occurred. And he's also one of the founders of the uh, uh, Hispanic Caucus Institute, uh, Congressman Bob Garcia from the Bronx. And then the second question was, what is the future of sanctuary cities, and how long can, a, a, like the District of Columbia, which has so much uh, federal oversight, continue to hold on uh, to that uh, ability? Laura, would you mind taking the first one? Yeah, the first one, um, so you know, oftentimes members of Congress look for a title of a bill to kind of have a symbolic moon meaning and often sort of stick in there a weird acronym. Um, so the dream part has held on based on the title of the bill, which I think the dream part um, has been, um, people hang on to it because of the aspirational part of it. I think the... Well, uh, yeah, and the, yeah, the idea of uh, the American dream. Um, the title probably would not still be as beloved. Um, it refers to the Development Relief Education for Alien Minors Act. Um, so I think hey. that's what <laughs> a lot of people um, loved, you know, just calling people dreamers instead of alien minors. Um, so, uh, but, the, you know, a lot of people have... Uh, used it now to talk about, you know, my parents were the original dreamers, and their dream for our family's success um, is an, a tribute to them. So um, that's the history of it. And as, you know, a, a legislation gets introduced, that may change, but that's the history of it. On, on the second question, I, you know, I, I don't know, to be honest with you, Jay. I, I think um, 2020 is a big deal. Um, I think we all need to get out and vote. And I think voting will preserve um, mm -hmm. sanctuary cities. And the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, we are going to continue in the District of Columbia to push back and be on the defensive. But um, I've been really pushing my colleagues to also be on the offensive. Um, and that uh, if you want something and you believe in something enough, I think you have to be proactive. And so, for me, it's um, let's pass more laws uh, that protects people's rights and force their hand uh, and keep doing that. Um, a good example, I'll give you a quick one, uh, really quick. Um, we should, I think, in every jurisdiction in this country, um, remove any affiliation with Real ID. Um, mm -hmm. The Real ID law, I think, was a failure. It's a national ID. It's a way to separate our communities. Um, and in the District of Columbia specifically, we have a license that complies with Real ID. The only way it can comply with Real ID is if it puts a mark on your license if you're undocumented. And I voted against this, and I fought against it, and I think it's an irresponsible act. 
So uh, there are ways that we can be proactive <coughs> that um, will, I think, mm -hmm. produce a better result and make us a more, um, I guess, genuine sanctuary city. At the same time, um, when you are proactive, you put the other side a little on the defensive. And then that uh, spends their time a little doing things on the defensive means they're not trying to undercut what we're trying to do here. I would like to add, in my advocacy role, um, there's a lot more DC could be doing as a sanctuary city. And I think pressure needs to, especially now. Um, you know, at the youth center, there's a lot of opportunity. And what you can take advantage of often depends on what the origination of the funding was. If it was federal, you, you met certain criteria. Anyway, it's a long funding complex story. But anyway, a lot of kids could not get into certain things. The city could fill that gap and so that these kids would not feel like second class citizens with, with non-federal money. And this is something I've been pushing for for a long time, but sort of to, to deaf ears. I mean, it sounds nice to say you're sanctuary and it's wonderful that we're getting this little teeny pot of money for legal stuff. And the advocacy community was in front of the council last week trying to kick that up, double it, because it really is not enough. But there's so much more. The city could spend some of its appropriated dollars on summer internships for kids that can't get into the federal programs. There's so much that could be done. Because at the end of the day, when a door is closed, j simply because of your immigration status, okay. you become a second-class citizen. And that's how you feel. And that's not the intention. But then if you're going to call yourself a sanctuary city, let's do more beyond just calling ourselves that. You know, even though we are doing more, but there's still more that we could do. I'll just note that. Thank you all. Another question? Uh, I'm just name is Dave Onsbach, uh, retired. Um, <coughs> I guess you, you, you obviously know about Donald Trump's nationalist nativist bent. He wants to close the borders, secure the borders, keep the immigra immigrants out, all that stuff. But, I'm sh but you obviously know that Donald Trump is also pandered to the religious right with their pro-natalist, uh, pro-life, quote unquote, position. And maybe it's time to put it out there um, that, uh, you know, th that these uh, many conservatives uh, consider life a precious gift from God in the womb, but after the life is born, want to build costly steel and concrete barriers to control the movement of that life. Uh, that maybe Barney Frank is right, that the life that many of these so-called, you know, pro-life Conservatives care about begins at conception and ends at birth, uh, uh, and, and and maybe show conservatives that if you truly hate immigration coming across the border, that it's in your interest to support effective plan family planning and birth control now. No more Mexico City rule, gag rule, or whatever they call it. You know, uh, you know. I mean, it's uh, just pointing out that inconsistency. You know, you know, if life is, you know. Uh, um, not precious to you after it's born, why is it so precious to you only when it's in the womb? Thanks. Thank you. Um, <coughs> just like to take a moment to recognize uh, the LGBTQ plus community in all of this. Uh, and locally, uh, there was news yesterday of uh, Casa Ruby, which is one of the, the most important service organizations in the city. Um, and they're an amazing organization. If you don't know them, please look them up and support them. They uh, are right now hosting a large group of LGBTQ plus immigrants from Latin America. And um, if you do follow the LGBTQ side of the immigration debate and, and news, um, you'll know that many of the people who come and who are refused asylum go back and face violence. And there have been at least two deaths very recently because of this. And it is um, shameful on so many levels because it, it is a thing that is happening and it's, it's very apparent and it's reported back home in those home countries too. Um, but uh, I'd like to also give a shout out to the Washington Blade, which is one of the preeminent news media organizations covering <coughs> LGBTQ plus issues in Latin America nation, uh, nationwide. So uh, there's a lot happening in DC that's helping shed light on these issues and the stories. And it's so much of this is about getting the stories out, uh, whether it's through the arts or through the news or through advocacy so that everyone can think about this and make their own decisions about how they would like to approach policy and their lawmakers. Um, and one of the things that we've been really trying to do at Washington Performing Arts through this series is create opportunities for folks to tell their stories in a way that works for them, which means this past Sunday we had a, a, a 
great musician from Venezuela named Jonathan Acosta. He is here on an artist visa, which is amazing. Um, and he can't go home at the moment for m multiple reasons with the situation there. So that's one story that's very immediate. We had uh, students from Gala Hispanic Theater's Paso Nuevo Youth Program perform at the Kennedy Center Millennium Stage in January on a program called Voices uh, of Change where they got to share a theatrical work that touched many of the themes that they've lived and that they're experiencing on a daily basis. So I encourage everyone who wants to learn more about these stories uh, to check out the arts. Uh, it's a great place that's welcoming to everyone in all pers perspectives. Uh, for example, this week at Gala, there's a new work called Poetic Chicle, which is based on the same themes. A uh, wonderful artist named Kike Aviles is performing that, so we encourage you to check them out. And organizations like Gala, uh, like LAYC, like the public schools in DC, um, like Unidos, Unidos US, uh, are all playing a role in supporting the community and supporting folks to tell their own stories. Uh, and that is the empowerment that changes lives on both sides of it. It changes the lives of the people telling their stories and it changes our lives as people hearing the stories. Uh, so I congratulate everyone on the important work that has Thank been do done and is continuing to be done at all of our organizations. Sorry for my rant. Uh, uh, Nick, can I add I something to take that? Take advantage of my soapbox. Can I just add something to that? I mean, I think uh, one of the places where I hear the most number of stories is um, every uh, quarter or so, a group called DC Scores has poetry slams. So they do um, school programs um, after school and, and obviously during the summer too, where they do soccer and poetry. And at these poetry slams, what you hear is um, the stories of immigrant children, but you also hear the stories of native DC children. And you quickly, and they do it through poetry, right? So it's spoken word, they stand in front of, these are young, you know, elementary, middle uh, students who, um, tell these stories and you see the overlap very quickly of the experiences that students and youth who grow up in difficult situations fairly often are experiencing. And then you see the hope too because they, they recite these poems and they talk about it and it is really through the art um, that they heal too, that they are given an opportunity to express themselves to, to move beyond their adversity. And I think it's really a beautiful testament to the arts and um, to, the, to the work that uh, DC Scores is doing too. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm Paul Ramshaw. It has, uh, it, does any member of Congress or any uh, outside advocacy group drafting a bill for what they would, what, what we would like the immigration program to be? Yeah, so um, I think in the new Congress, it's a little bit, uh, early for a lot of the bills to that we are going to be seeing that they haven't yet been introduced. But um, I mean, today was the introduction of the Dream and Promise Act. That's the, you know, both the combination of the Dream Act and a solution, a legislative solution for TPS. I think there is going to be more comprehensive uh, legislation that includes, um, you know, the additional 11, you know, up to 11 million uh, undocumented people with other components of our immigration system that need to be fixed. So we'll see some bills around that. Um, then we'll see members that really champion particular things. Um, there's conversations around TPS for Venezuelans now. Um, so, I mean, there's a ton of advocacy for practical solutions. There's a lot of members who are interested in putting that on paper, whether any of those measures will, you know, sort of gather steam is the part, you know, the question. Um, and in the absence of a legislative solution in Congress, I think there's so much room for advocacy at the local level uh, to move things that way. Yeah, and I think Nick touched on it with a question earlier. A few years ago when there was some hopefulness, there was a lot in it advocates and some people just didn't like. And there were conversations all over the country about should we support this, shouldn't we support this, is it the best thing we can get, um, should we go for it? And at the end of the day, most of the advocacy community stood for it. But it was a little bit painful even. So you know, it's, it, it's no comprehensive immigration law is gonna make everybody happy. You know, it just seems there's an inevitability of that in this country, that someone's gonna have a different point of view, which I guess is a good thing, a democracy. But, um, 
But anyway, it was tough a few years ago. We all had to face our own selves and say, are we going to push this or not? And at the end of the day, with national leadership and other leadership, we decided to all get behind it. And I, I can add that um, if you look at the border states, that's usually some of the, the members of Congress um, who are, you historically have a lot more information, right? They're, they have the, the issues with the commerce, people going back and forth as well. So for example, um, in our organization, um, Congressman Mario diaz Ballard has been working on some immigration, whether that's actually gonna be you know, rolled out in a specific bill. But to her point, it, that may be or may not. Um, Congressman Henry Cuellar, who's also a big supporter of, of good, fair trade uh, in Texas, has been working on, on some as well. So to the points made earlier, because it was this massive, comprehensive immigration reform, there's a lot of pieces in there that individually different members of Congress in different states really liked, and so some of them are still keeping some of those alive and trying to collectively see how they can, how they can work together. Um, and so sometimes um, you have the members who have been here a little bit longer, who have more experience with different immigration um, policies, uh, whether it's at their, their district or even at their state level or because of the committees that they've served before, they have a little bit more information from committee to committee that they go, but collectively, you know, I can't even tell you, there, she's the expert over here in that area to actually say so-and-so has this bill coming. So I would say the watch, pay attention to the members on the border states. Thank you, I think we have time for one last question. Hi, um, you all touched uh, about how the, the trauma that these students uh, experience when they're separated from their uh, families. And, and I'm, apologies if you already touched on this because um, I, I, I missed it. What, is, what happens when you know, ICE goes into a school and, and, and removes a child from, from a class or something like that? How, is this something that is spoken to with you know, the principal or whatever bef right beforehand or do they just come into a school and you know, go find the student in a classroom and then once they remove um, that uh, child, how soon are they able to get back together with their families? So uh, what I would say is that there's a couple of things. Um, we don't know of cases where an ICE agent has entered into a school. We Actually on the perimeter. So we do, right. I mean, it would be, um, you know, there's a policy that they should follow that says there's sensitive locations like schools where they should not be carrying out enforcement actions like churches, hospitals, um, schools. Um, there are, have been violations of that in our, the idea that the spirit of the policy should be that you know, in the school grounds or areas around a school. And in fact, we've seen cases where as a parent is dropping off a child, um, the parent gets uh, stopped by an ICE agent and then, um, you know, the children are in the car. Um, so we know of cases like that. Um, and in those cases, I mean, a little bit to the points that have been made about the individual actions and the community rallying around that family um, have been incredible. And so in these cases, the parent has been the person detained. And um, it's actually been you know, the school administrators and the principal that has had to take responsibility for that child and what will happen that day and the following day and in the weeks and months to come. Um, where a community has really had to be involved. The other way that we've seen this play out um, is in work site uh, enforcement actions. So ICE agents uh, in really large sort of military style um, enforcement actions will descend on employers um, saying that there's, you know, th practices where they're employing people who are undocumented. And so we've seen this in places like uh, Tennessee, Ohio, North Carolina, and various parts of the country with increased frequency. And the kids are at school, their parents are working, and the kids get a call from usually, you know, another relative who says, you know, the parent calls the school and says, 
this, or the relative calls the school and says, no one is going to be home when that child is going to be home. So again, that's the place where churches have set up these rapid response kind of things so that the kids have a place to go to be met by a relative or a caregiver. Um, so it's really um, uh, something that we've had to see, unfortunately, community-based organizations and churches learn how to address these situations. And that's something so, you know, we've had to counsel parents to have a plan mm -hmm. and to have paperwork in order. You know, if you get suddenly deported, I mean, some parents are thinking, well, should I go, shouldn't I go? You know, so it's not an immediate... But you know, your, your child's school records, your child's health immunizations, you know, information if you have a, a bank account or you hide it, so your money under your bed somewhere, you know, some trusted colleague to have a plan because it, it could happen. You know, they, they hang around the perimeters of the schools and, and generally they're looking for someone specific. It's not, you know, just grab anybody but sometimes they just sort of, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So the counseling and working with families to say, you know, get your stuff, get your, not, get, get your paperwork in order mm -hmm. so that at least you, you're leaving a, you have the vital information that you need in, you know, the horrible event that someone from that family unit were to be picked up. You know, where they get sent sometimes is so hard to figure out. And we're, you know, you, are they in this place or this place? Have they been moved? How do you track it? Finding an immigration lawyer. You know, it's tough because they, they don't like to keep them too close to home either. They like to move them sort of away. Um, you know, but, and you think of that in the context of they don't even know where the parents are of these children that have been separated. You know, it's just, it's just, it's kind of like, it, it, it's, it's kind of unbelievable, you know, but it, sadly it's not. It, you have to believe it and embrace it and figure out what to do. Thank you. I just would like to recognize another organization uh, locally, which is the Care Coalition. Uh, we were to have Kathy Doan with us tonight, uh, but unfortunately she was ill, so she sends her regrets. But uh, they are, uh, from my understanding, a basic, Rapid response force to support people who need. Brian's here. He works Hi Brian. there. Thanks yeah. for being here. Mm -hmm. Yay, Brian. So <laughs> Brian's been helping a lot. The Care Coalition, we all partner mm -hmm. and we all try to support yeah. each other. Thank you. Um, so before we totally wrap, I uh, just want to remind everyone of uh, the artistic project that has prompted this conversation happening, uh, and that is a work called Dreamers, which is by a Peruvian American composer named Jimmy Lopez, who actually just became a citizen a few months ago. Uh, he had been here on uh, student and artist visas for, for several years. Uh, and then it's also uh, containing a libretto by Pulitzer-winning Cuban-American poet uh, and playwright Nilo Cruz, who himself came here, I believe, at age eight as a Cuban refugee. Uh, so they're coming to this project not as dreamers, but uh, as people who are intimately familiar with the processes uh, that some of uh, the subjects are dealing with. Um, the work is going to be performed uh, and premiered in California at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, we're going to be simulcasting that here at 6 p.m. on Sunday, March 17th in D.C. at the Sydney Harmon Hall. That event is free. Uh, and it's going to be a really great celebration of the community that has been engaged in the project. We're going to be featuring uh, Latinx small business owners who have come through the Carlos Rosario International Public Charter School's small business program, as well as students from Carlos Rosario who are adult immigrant uh, learners, and they are going to perform a work called I'm an Immigrant in the pre-show festivities. And we'll also have that Venezuelan artist I mentioned uh, doing a pop-up performance uh, in the lobby, Jonathan Acosta. So that's all free. Check us out at washingtonperformingarts.org slash dreamers for more information. Uh, and I'd like to thank, uh, of course, our panelists, and I'll get back to you all in a second, but uh, a special uh, thanks to our hosts here at NYU DC, uh, Polly, Tom, and Michael, who have been amazing to work with. Uh, if you ever need some um, uh, wonderful partners, uh, they are a, a great team, delight to, to work with, very um, very supportive. And uh, if this, who's here for the first time tonight at NYU DC? Would you mind identifying yourselves? Great, 
Awesome. So please come back. They have programming every night of the week, and <laughs> basically. And uh, it, it is all live streamed, and they're really uh, helping facilitate some important dialogues for the city, uh, holistically, not just from the policy side, but clearly uh, engaging different communities. Uh, so last but not least, thank you, panelists, and thank you to all of the organizations that you represent, uh, first and foremost, for the work that you're doing day in and day out, 24-7, as I know this work is. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your leadership in all of this uh, in the community here in DC and also nationally as, as an example of uh, how we can come together to do it properly. And uh, one of the amazing things of, of experiences like this is I think we all kind of become family in, in the fight. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, and if there's anything that Washington Performing Arts can do for any of you and for any of you in the audience, please let us know. We want to be here to support uh, anything that you need. And that is what community is about. So thank you all, and uh, thank you NYDC. Appreciate your being here, and we hope to see you at another event soon.